Hi there, I'm Jason Harlow. Uh, this video will go over uh, chapter 11 of Wolfson. And the sections are angular velocity and angular acceleration vectors, uh, torque and the vector cross product, uh, angular momentum and conservation of angular momentum, and we'll end up the chapter on gyroscopes and precession. I have a little demonstration for that. And you can see we've got the uh, spinning earth there. And the quote above is that so far we've ascribed direction to, to rotational motion by just saying clockwise or counterclockwise. But that's not enough. If we want to talk about that rotating earth, it would be nice to know where the plane of rotation is and where the axis is. And so we're going to come up with a vector for angular velocity. Okay, so remember that angular speed, omega, was d theta by dt, the time derivative of the angular position, and that had units of radians per second. So now we want to have a, a vector version of that, and there's, I suppose, a lot of ways you could do it, but the way we do it in physics is that we say the angular velocity vector omega points along the axis of rotation. Now, uh, it can do that in one of two ways, right? Uh, up or down basically and so we use what's called the right hand rule for rotation to to let us know which way that is and the way you do that is that human fingers uh, only bend easily one way you can look at your own hand and, and notice that right um, so you use your right hand uh, you extend your th uh, thumb upwards and then curl your fingers in the direction of rotation and then your thumb points in the direction of this angular velocity vector. It's just a convention that we all use. So let's see if you've got it. A bicycle is traveling towards the right. What is the direction of the angular velocity of the wheels here? Take a look at the choices, press pause in the video, try your right hand rule, and then I'll tell you if you got it right or not. Okay, so the answer was C, into the screen. And you can see there that we've got the, uh, if the bicycle is moving towards the right, the wheels must be moving uh, clockwise. So hopefully you figured that out. So here's my right hand. And if I bend my fingers naturally, oh, that's the wrong way. So that's uh, going to be counterclockwise, right? So that's not right. So how do I do this? I guess the only way I can do this is turn my hand right around. Okay, there we go. That's right. So now, if you look at my thumb, it's pointing away from you. So that would be into the screen of your, of, that you're looking at right now. So C, into the screen. Okay, so now we have a vector version of omega. We can have a vector version of the time derivative of omega, which was alpha. So alpha being the limit as delta t goes to zero of delta omega over delta t. That's the time derivative of this omega vector. So now angular acceleration has a vector. If the alpha and omega are in the same direction, that means the thing's um, getting faster and faster. Um, the magnitude of omega is increasing. Uh, if the alpha vector is opposite the direction of omega, that means that it's slowing down. Okay, so the omega is decreasing in magnitude. Or it could be in uh, arbitrary direction, which would actually change the direction of the rotation axis. Okay, so now I want to do a little bit of math review here. Uh, I don't know if this has come up in your math class yet, but uh, we already did earlier in the semester a scalar product of multiplying two vectors. This was, I think it came up first in the chapter on work, where we were doing, it's the uh, force uh, dot, the, uh, the displacement. Well, now there's a different way to multiply two vectors, which ends up with a, a vector, and that's called cross product. And the magnitude is uh, the ma is uh, a times b of a cross b is a times b times sine of the angle between them, and the direction of the resulting vector uh, you use what's called a right-hand rule for cross product. So if a is going to the right and b is going up, uh, and here's your alpha vector, then the cross product is perpendicular to the plane uh, formed by vectors a and b. And then the length of this vector is proportional to this, uh, the sine of this angle. So if the two vectors are, are parallel, cross product is zero. And if the two vectors are perpendicular, then that's when the cross product is going to be maximum. So uh, this right-hand rule for cross products comes in many forms. 
you can try them all to see which works best for you. Uh, here's one where you point with your index finger along B, your thumb along A. Uh, A cross B is where your, yeah, I guess your middle finger sticks up. Uh, this is one I kind of like to use because it's similar to the right hand rule for rotation, which is that you start with, uh, you, you know, you put your thumb up and your fingers straight out along the vector A, and then you curl your fingers towards vector B, then your thumb is pointing in the direction of A cross B. So that's my favorite in the middle. And then the other one is uh, sort of the screw rule or the peanut butter jar lid rule. So if you start your I guess peanut butter jar lid in the direction of A and then you rotate it in the direction of B then because of the way it's screwing it'll go in the direction of A cross B so uh, you know righty tighty lefty loosey kind of, kind of rule there and what's interesting about cross product is that you can, when you reverse the order of uh, A, A cross B it's not equal to B cross A. In fact, it's equal to the negative of, of B cross A. So if you switch the order, you flip the direction of the cross product. Okay, so what's it useful for? Uh, cross product comes up in torque. So uh, we defined in, in chapter 10 that torque was R times F times sine theta. That's the cross product, actually. Uh, so you can have a vector version of torque, which is R, this uh, direction from the rotation axis to where you're applying the, the force cross with that force and that'll give you the torque. So example um, here is a nut on a wheel and you have a wrench you're applying a force on the wrench at the end of the handle straight downwards and here is the radius vector going from that nut out to uh, where you're applying the force so that's your F downwards uh, you're crossing that with this vector which is going up and to the right. So let's actually draw that right here. And then this is, I guess, this R vector. There's your theta. If you cross uh, down there, then you're going to have your torque vector coming up uh, out of the screen towards you. So out of the screen and uh, magnitude of R times F times the sine of that angle phi. Okay, let's see if you've got it. Um, so here is a sort of a perspective view of a force that is going into the screen, uh, a vector r which is going to the right, showing um, uh, the direction where the, where the force is applied, or the location where the force is applied relative to the pivot point. Uh, so what's the torque of this force? Is it up and to the left, up and to the right, straight up, or straight down? Think about that, press pause, and I'll tell you the answer. Okay, so it's R cross F. R is to the right. Use your one of your right hand rules to cross it with F. You should have the resulting torque vector being straight up out of the plane. So it's it's uh, it's T three or C. Okay, now we're on to section eleven point three on angular momentum, and I'm going to start with angular momentum of a particle of mass m, and uh, the particle has a momentum vector p which is at an angle uh, beta relative to its position um, from the origin, which is r. Okay, So we define the particle's angular momentum to be r cross with the linear momentum, p. So you can put all these together. There's the p going along the plus y axis. r is on this diagonal. There's the angle beta. Uh, r cross with p will be up along the z-axis. So it's perpendicular to the plane of the motion. Uh, it's proportional to p, proportional to r, and proportional to the, the angle between them. So actually, as a particle travels along with constant linear momentum as it passes the origin, the angular momentum of that particle will be constantly changing. So why do we use r, r cross p? Well, if you take the time derivative of this l vector, angular momentum, uh, and you use the definition of the torque vector, which is R cross F, you get that the time derivative of L is equal to the net torque. And that's exactly analogous to Newton's second law. Remember the time derivative of the momentum uh, was equal to the net force. Well now the time derivative of the, of the angular momentum is equal to the net torque. 
So if you have a rigid body now, something that's uh, rotating, then if the object is rotating on some fixed ax axle, like your bicycle wheel would, or it's rotating about a, a symmetry axis, then it can be shown that the angular momentum is just the moment of inertia of the object times omega. So then that's nice that the omega vector that we used for, uh, at the, you introduced at the very beginning of this uh, video, using that right-hand rule for rotation, is in the same direction as the angular momentum. And it's still the case here that as you apply a torque to it, a net torque to this object, it will give the time derivative of the angular momentum of that object. Next section, 11.4, is conservation of angular momentum. Uh, so we have that dl by dt is the net torque. If there is no net torques on an, on an object or any system, then the angular momentum vector is constant. So dl by dt is going to be b0. So let's see if you've got that. Uh, a figure skater pulls in her arms while rotating. What happens to her angular speed omega? Does it decrease, increase, or stay the same? Press pause. Think about that. I'll tell you my answer. Okay, so here's a funny little video getting faster and faster. <laughs> okay, and we can see it again and again. It's obviously some sort of computer graphics, but it's still pretty funny. Uh, as she pulls her arms in, uh, omega definitely increases. So why is that? Well, as long as friction down here is pretty low, then there's going to be no uh, net external torques. And so this L, which is I, her moment of inertia times omega, will be constant. L1 equals L2. But what happens as she brings her arms in? Well, that's taking some of the mass that was far from the axis and bringing it in close to the axis. So I1 was large when her arms are out. I2, her moment of inertia, is decreasing. So to keep the product of i times omega the same, if omega starts out small, then it has to get bigger to compensate. Okay, so the last section here uh, in chapter 11 is called gyroscopes and precession. And I actually have a little gyroscope here, which is just like a, it's a top that can spin. Um, and then we have uh, what you can see here is the Eiffel Tower, uh, I have a little uh, thing on the top, and I can put it on there. And if I tilt it, Let's say I tilt it this way and I let it go, whoop, then gravity will pull it over and cause it to fall. So what I can do is I can take a string and put it through here and wind it up and then carefully uh, pull the string so it's really spinning and then place it on top of the Eiffel Tower. Whoop. And now what's interesting is that it's spinning, but it's also the axis is going around really slowly. So you can imagine it's spinning many hundreds of times uh, per second. I'm getting closer to the microphone here. But as it's doing that, about once every one, two, three, four, five seconds, uh, it's going right around. And as time's gone on, uh, its actual spinning is a little slower, but the procession is going faster, which is interesting, and it's right on its side right now. Okay, so how does this work? So we start with gravity on a non-spinning gyroscope. So just a disc which is held on this, uh, this rod R, okay? And we set up a X, Y, uh, Z axis system. Um, and so the and the disc is along Z okay so when it's released what will happen is gravity will pull the center of mass downwards there's the force of gravity there's that vector R and so gravity exerts a torque R cross F if you do cross product of Z with this negative Y direction you get that the gravity torque is along the plus uh, X direction and what that's going to do is that's going to change the angular momentum uh, of the wheel and it's going to cause it to get angular momentum about the x direction. So the, over a small amount of time dt there will be this dl uh, increasing the angular momentum in the x direction. And what that does is it causes it to rotate uh, angular velocity vector which is around 
the x-axis in this yz plane. So it means it's going to fall. Okay, it's going to rotate downwards like this. This angular momentum vector just gets bigger and bigger. Okay, so it's just a fancy way of watching this fall. But if there's a spinning gyroscope, then what's different here is that it starts off, if it's spinning, let's say, uh, counterclockwise here, it starts off with a large angular momentum vector that's along the z direction. You've got the same gravity acting downwards. Uh, that's going to give a torque in the plus x direction. And then what's going to happen is that the gyroscope will shift its angular momentum vector slightly in the plus x direction. So viewing this from above, here's er, the initial L vector going uh, towards Z, which is down here, and you've got uh, the DL, which is in the direction of the torque, going along x to the right. And so what that'll do is if you add L plus a change in L, you'll get a little shift in the angular momentum vector from uh, Z in the, uh, toward x in the horizontal plane. And then later, uh, since the gravitational torque vector is always perpendicular uh, to the axle, this dL will always be perpendicular to L, and it'll actually carry this L around in a circular path around in the horizontal plane. So that's how we have precession. And if you want to work out the precession frequency, uh, it's actually a problem from Wolfson, uh, problem 11.61. Consider a rapidly spinning gyroscope of mass m whose axis is precessing uniformly in a horizontal circle of radius r. So r is the distance from the center of the circle out to the, out to the center of mass of the gyroscope. It tells you that the spin angular momentum of the gyroscope is l. What's the angular speed of precession, uh, which is, I guess, the angular frequency of precession about the vertical axis? So we can draw the spinning omega there and r, the distance from this uh, pivot. There's the x-axis that's uh, going to process towards the x-axis. There's z and y is up. So there's uh, gravity acting downwards, mg. The torque due to gravity is going to be r cross f. So that'll actually be rmg in the plus x direction, as we figured out in the previous slide. So, and our, if we look, I guess, from above, from the plus uh, y, plus z is down, there's your angular momentum vector. Your little dl will be in the plus x direction. So how much will that change l? It'll change it by d theta, let's call it. So if l is large, that means this dl is much smaller. So we can use this small angle approximation, d theta is equal to dl divided by l. So now we use Newton's second law for rotation, which is that dl by dt equals tau. Uh, now that was equal to rmg. So dl is going to be equal to rmg times dt. Okay, and now plugging that in to our small angle approximation above, we can get d theta is this dl divided by l. So then dividing by dt again, you get d theta by dt. We're going to call that this uh, precession, uh, angular speed of precession, which is what we're trying to find here, is just r times m times g divided by l. So that can be called the angular speed of precession. I also call it the angular, or sorry, the angular frequency in radians per second of this precession as it goes around capital omega. Okay, so recall that this l is equal to i times omega, and that's lowercase omega because we're talking about the spin angular momentum. Uh, if we go back to capital omega, that's the uh, precession frequency, that's now equal to r times m times g divided by i times lowercase omega, the spin uh, frequency. So what that means is that the spin frequency goes up, it means the precession frequency goes down, since the lowercase omega is on the bottom there. And that's exactly what we saw in the demonstration. I guess friction was causing this uh, spin frequency to slowly be decreasing over time. And then as we were seeing it precess, uh, it was processing faster and faster as it was spinning down. And so that is it for chapter 11, and I'll see you in class.